together this morning and we're going to all join in and sing the family of God. Welcome to South Fork. We're glad you're here today. We could all gather together uh, in this house and worship together. It's going to be a great day. We uh, are, are excited today to see all of our Samaritan shoe, uh, per box, uh, American, <laughs> Samaritan's purse, shoe boxes. Why do they put purse and shoes right there at the same time? <laughs> that confuses some of us. I got it out, but it's fine. Uh, anyway, we're glad that you're all here and wanted to say welcome as our time begins this morning. We have some announcements. If you have a bulletin, we'll just pick the, the several that are, are, are important, then you can read it all. But if we sat here and read it all, we might be here a while. So I just wanted to bring up a few things. Uh, the Circle of Hope Thanksgiving Supper is tomorrow. Uh, be, you're invited to that if you're a part of the Circle of Hope. And uh, so they're going to be gathering uh, for that. Uh, we do have um, some other things that are coming up. Again, Christmas practice. You could see some of those things. Uh, we want to wish congratulations to Heather and Brandon Miller on the birth of their son, Harris Lee Miller, born this past week on the 12th. And so we're excited to uh, welcome him into the world and be excited when we get to welcome him here. Uh, th th we are also announcing for the renovation fund an online bake sale. Uh, we, we have done one in the past. It went really well. This time we're going to want to do one the third week in December. And that way uh, we'll have tons of desserts and things for, for people to have during their Christmas gatherings. But you can think now if you'd like to bake something or contribute in some way to that, uh, have that uh, in your mind already that that's coming. You'll see more details about that earlier. I also want to announce a country breakfast for Center Methodist Church uh, coming up this Saturday, November the 23rd from 6.30 a.m. to 10. They're going to have all kinds of country breakfast goodness, and the proceeds go to uh, benefit Western North Carolina. Are there any other announcements that need to be made at this time? Standing in the hallway. Okay. Okay. So there are a few things in the hallway uh, left over from the barbecue, and we'd like for those to disappear. If you put an extra couple of dollars in Judy's pocket, then uh, we can just add that to the total. Add that to the. She will honestly and dutifully add that to the right account, and and our our total for the uh, barbecue will continue to go up. Uh, but we, we would like for those not to be here anymore. If you walk by and something might be useful to you, we'll make you a deal. Any other announcements? We do have some items on our prayer list. Our, our prayer list can get kind of long sometimes. And so I want to read some that are mentioned in the uh, uh, Sunday school classroom that, that meets. And then uh, we'll open it up to see if others want to add some folks for us to consider in our prayers today. Uh, James Darren Brewer, Tammy Dunlap, Michael Dalton, uh, John Clausen, family, co-workers, uh, some new classes, Bob Crawley, Gail Black, Matthew Johnson and his family. Matthew did uh, get home from the hospital uh, yesterday evening. Uh, they had been saying a 10-day recovery, and he turned that into six. 
So that's, uh, we're happy about that. Uh, Billy Cockman, Trudy Davis, Ronnie Lindley, uh, Ann Johnson, uh, the family of Jeff Capes, Nancy Murkison, Heather Brandon and Harris Miller, uh, Kendall, Eli, and James, of course, was just born, and then Abby Andrew and their uh, baby girl soon. Uh, for Dan Stafford, we all have many unspoken requests, and to continue to remember Peggy Lindley and Carrie Petty. Are there those that we'd like to mention out loud today to add to our prayer list today? Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Any others? One of the things that they encourage us to do, and in your bulletin, we hope you have a little handout called Pray With Us from Samaritan's Purse, is to, as we get together and we, we put together these boxes and we're getting ready to send those to uh, Samaritan's Purse and deliver those and they're getting ready to deliver them all over the world, is to pray for those and to pray for those boxes. And so we have a habit here of coming forward. If you want to, we're going to ask if we will, if the kids would come up and pray over these also. But I know some adults may want to come and surround these boxes and we want to have a special time of prayer today. As we send these boxes, each one of these boxes represents a child who through this box we hope we'll learn that Jesus loves them in a substantial way so I wonder if we would at this time if, if the children if they would would you kids would y'all like to come forward and pray for these boxes I know a lot of the kids help put together boxes why don't y'all come forward and I know we have others adults who uh, you know love this project and may want to come up and what I'd encourage us to do if you're interested in coming forward anybody's welcome is put your hand on a box and hold a box and we're going to pray for these boxes as we get ready to send them and pray for the children who will receive these boxes on on our behalf uh, really as an act of love of Jesus Christ during this holiday season but y'all come on forward come on Hudson come on Maybe yes, maybe no. <laughs> Let's pray together. We're going to pray for all of these prayer requests and also for these boxes. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this day. We're grateful that we have access through prayer to a wonderful God who loves us. If we could only imagine the love that you had for us, the height and the depth and the width of your love, it would change our hearts forever in a wonderful way. And so we're praying for that today. As we see your love, we want to send that love. We want for other people to see that love. And so we've put together as a congregation, as individuals, as groups in this church, we put together these boxes. We fill them with toys and, and all kinds of different things and socks and, and all, every, everything imaginable we could put in there. And we want it for the children who are going to receive these boxes to be a sign of your love to be an, a, a physical expression of the fact that there's a God who loves them. It may be a God in their region that they've not had a chance to hear from. And yet, as Samaritan's Purse goes into these neighborhoods and into these villages and into these uh, countries that we've ne maybe never been to, we, we know that they're carrying your gospel. And so we pray, Lord, for these boxes. We pray for each child. I know at the beginning of our time, but we had over 120 already. I think there's more than that now, Lord. We pray for each child. We don't know who's going to get these boxes. We don't know when they get on a truck where they're going to end up. We think you already know. We think you know the kid who's going to receive each one of these ahead of time. Because you're God, because you know everything. And so we pray for each child in advance of them getting this, that you would soften their hearts to hear about your love. To know that you love them, Lord. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to be a part of this wonderful program. We lift up to you others in our church who we know are going through difficult times, who we know need an expression of your love, many of whom are not here today. Many of those are struggling. Some are recovering from operations. Some getting ready for things, Lord. You know each situation more than we do. And so we just pray for a big dose of your love, a dose of healing for those who need it today, Lord. And in all the power that we don't have, you have it, and we entrust it. In the name of Jesus Christ, we lift our prayers today. Amen. Thank you all for coming forward.
and being a part of that. I appreciate that. We started a while back in the month of November collecting our offering again. We want to do that again today, a physical expression of our thanksgiving to God for how he has blessed us. So we want to invite our ushers forward to receive our offering at this time. Let's all stand together and sing doxology.
I want us to read a passage together out of the book of Proverbs. It's kind of at the beginning of the book and uh, doing a lot of our uh, series on prayer that we've been talking about. A lot of those prayers are at the beginning of the book, but the beginning of the books have a lot of introductory material and sometimes it's easy to skip over, but this is about the beginning of knowledge. And one of the things that Paul prays for on two or three different occasions as we've been following the prayers of Paul is for us to have knowledge. And there's a particular way of going about getting knowledge and the beginning of knowledge. And so I want us to read together a Proverbs chapter 1 verses 1 through 7. And then we'll have a time of open worship. If during that time of open worship you'd like to share and something that would be beneficial to the group, we invite you to do that. Uh, these are the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, in justice, in equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. It's interesting, there are those who want wisdom and go after it. There are those who despise wisdom and instruction and don't want it. And so it seems to me God is saying that to one who wants wisdom and knowledge, we, we do it in the right way, but then there's some who don't. Uh, and so to understand a proverb and a saying, uh, is a wonderful thing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. The fear is not there but being afraid of God, but learning to respect and recognize in the same way that we would uh, something that, you know, we're not afraid of here, but we, we recognize its power like fire or something like that. We respect it in that way as the fear of the Lord. So uh, we wanted to read that and then have a time of open worship.
Sorry, I'm not getting a light on my lapel mic. We, we tested it this morning, but it's not coming on one way or the other. Okay. Sorry about that. Technical difficulties happen sometimes, don't they? So we've been talking about uh, several weeks back. I want to go and revisit because we're getting ready to change gears next week and talk about Thanksgiving and then go into Christmas. And so we've been talking about prayer for, for a little while and we begin talking about it with the story of Daniel in the lion's den. The story of Daniel in the lion's den is that Daniel was moved from one place, his home country, into another in captivity. And, and they uh, plotted against him to take him out, and they knew the one place they could plot against him was his prayer life. It was something to him so valuable that he wouldn't give it up. His time with God, his prayer every day, three times a day, was something very significant. And so they put up a law saying you couldn't pray to your God, only to the king at the time. And the, the, if you did that and were caught... You would get thrown into the lion's den. And so what was amazing to me, we all know Daniel went to the lion's den, but Daniel had a choice not to go to the lion's den. Daniel could have closed his curtains at night when he prayed and nobody would have seen him, but that wasn't good enough for Daniel. He wanted them to know he was praying to his God. He was praying in the direction of Jerusalem and he did it three times a day and he wasn't going to stop for anybody else. And the idea I think in Daniel's mind is God has brought me to this place I'm going to stay close to God, and it doesn't matter what you threaten me with, nothing is as big as what God has done already. When Paul talks to us, and we've been looking at some of the prayers of Paul in some of the books that he's written or letters that he's written to the churches at the time, what Paul seems to say, and he said it two or three times, he said, we're going to pray, but we're going to pray with thanksgiving so that when we pray to God, we're going to also admit that God has already done so much for us. He has brought us to this place so that when we begin our time of prayer, we're already basing it on the long history of what God has done for us. It's not just prayer in a vacuum. It's prayer in a long line of everything that God has done for us. And for that reason, then, we can have faith and we can look at prayer in different light. Now, as we go into today's passage, we'll be in the book of Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to pick up a little bit on that fo carrying forward that long tradition and bringing that into our prayer lives. And we're going to look at it in a slightly different way. But I want to show you all a picture. How many of you know what this is? What is it? Bonsai tree. How many of you think that bonsai trees just automatically grow short? It's a possibility, right? There are miniature trees, miniature this, miniature that. Bonsai trees don't grow naturally miniature. If you want a tree to go, now there's certain species, of course, and there's some of them that are smaller than others. But what you do is when it starts to take root and it starts to sprout a little, you take the tap root, which is the main root coming out, and you tie it back into itself. And then if it has several more branches, right, what do you do? You take those main roots that are coming in and you tie them right back into each other. And when you replant it, what happens? Instead of the roots spreading out and going deep, they circle back to you and they keep the, the tree small. Yeah, I want us to talk about that for a minute because I think that's a really interesting concept. We're going to read in Ephesians chapter 3 and we're going to talk about this idea of roots in just a minute. Because prayer has natural byproducts that give us practical things in our lives. But we're going to connect it to what the Father has done. And so in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul has been writing his letter to the Ephesian church for a while. And he says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. What's the reason? If you go back to the rest of chapter 3, he's talking about suffering. We did a couple of weeks ago. When we suffer, instead of that taking us out of fellowship with Christ, where we're not spending time with him and, and all of that, it should lead us into deeper fellowship with Christ. In some ways, suffering allows us to identify with Christ and his suffering and create a depth of relationship we will never know if we don't know suffering. I'm not trying to say that all suffering in your life is there by God's plan because he wants you to grow closer to him. I'm saying it is a natural byproduct that we can enjoy while we're suffering. And so he says, but look, in the suffering, what happens is, I know that some of us, he, he uses the phrase, uh, might lose their, um, 
lose heart in this battle. And what he knows is that some of the people in the early church, when they lost heart, right, they were tempted to fall away from the church, tempted to fall away from God. And he says, in light of all of this suffering, in light of the difficulty that we're going through, I bow on my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. So he's connecting all prayers now and all prayers by every family up to this point back to the God who started the first family and has answered prayers from every family since. Then he says that according to the riches of his glory, some of us, it, this is a difficult thing. Y'all read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. There's a, church, a book out there, Rich Church, Poor Church. There's a different way of looking at it. And some of us look at life with a scarcity mentality. There's only a certain number of resources and we have to try to get ours. And, and, and there's some people who look at life and they say, you know, there's not a scarcity of resources. We can actually go out and create more resources and do better things. And some of us pray out of a scarceness mentality. I'm going to pray out of my own resources. We talked about this last time for Paul. And we used that quote by um, uh, Hudson Taylor, right? Some of us pray according to our resources, not God's. Paul here says we're not praying ever when we pray. We don't pray for our own resources or out of those. We pray out of the riches of his resources, his glory, his strength, his power, and his spirit. At the beginning of the prayer, he sets us up by talking about who God is. We're not praying to a weak God. We're not praying to an absent God. We're not praying to a sleepy God. We're not praying to a, a, a God who doesn't know what's going on. We're praying to the God of the universe. We're praying to God who through time has carried us to this place. And he's saying that what we're praying for is that according to his riches and glory, we might have strength and power through his spirit in our own being, in our inner being. What is he saying here? He's saying we need strength and power, strengthened with power. It's not our power, it's the spirit's power. Last week it was God's power, the Father's power. But it's meant to be in our inner being. It's not meant to be something that God is showing us strength through our muscles where we can lift something we have never lifted before. That might be a great thing. But he's saying spiritually speaking, we need to do something that we haven't done before. That's spiritual power in our inner being. And then uh, we get this precious verse here. So that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith. Remember last time he mentioned faith, hope, and love. We see faith and love again today. A byproduct of prayer is faith, hope, and love, right? All of those things that are important that he mentions in the book, to, the, the letter to the Corinthians. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts, not an outward faith, but an inward faith. And then he says that you being rooted and grounded in love. Now, love, understanding the love of God is a byproduct of faith. And the, the byproduct of understanding the love of God is being rooted and grounded in Christ, this is what he prays for, that you may have strength to comprehend, this is the knowledge part, right, that we know the wisdom of God, with all the saints who are also learning this same thing, what is the breadth and length and height and depth to know the, lo the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. It's an interesting thing here. So what he says is, I want y'all to pray. I'm praying that y'all will pray. And when you pray and when you meet God and when you learn about God, what God is going to do through life and sometime in response to suffering, right? That he loves you. And when he loves you, what's going to happen is when you go through life and you go through more suffering, instead of all of that suffering causing you to push away Christ and to do away with your prayer time and do away with your Bible study and do away with all of those things and go off on your own, what it's going to do, it's going to root you and ground you in him and in his love because it's going to push us closer toward Christ. It's going to push us closer toward, toward Christ. And what I wanted to do is show us a series of pictures today. And then we're going to leave with a, a benediction that Paul lists in the middle of that. Uh, it's hard to imagine when we look at a tree. When we look at a tree and when we see how, how big it grows out there. You know it's often not um, uh, uncommon for the tree root to be even a little bit bigger than the, than, the, than the canopy of the actual tree. A lot of times they're in line. I guess with some species it might be a little bit smaller. But this isn't uncommon where you'd have a tree and the branches are out there. And you're standing on that plot of ground. How many of you stop and think about all the root systems? Farmers especially might be tempted to understand a little bit more about all of that. I think a lot of us would sit under that tree 
on a warm day, drink a little bit of lemonade, enjoy the shade, and not think a whole lot about the roots. Right? But what about if a wind came along out of the east? What if a storm popped up? What if it started lightning? What's to keep that tree from coming down on us? Why does the tree stay where the tree is? It's grounded. It's rooted in such a way that it's, it's um, uh, able to stand up to, to the huge wind. Basically, that's a big tent catching wind. How many of you have been on the highway and, and a wind comes up and you're, you're driving next to a tractor trailer and that tractor trailer starts coming over? Or maybe better yet, you've driven the church bus. Any of y'all driven the church bus on a windy day and what happens? That wind comes along and you better go ahead and start, you better go ahead and start steering into the wind a little bit because it's just, this tree is like a big tent. How many of y'all, all right, how many of y'all keep saying that? You, you've watched a storm come through, maybe it's a hurricane, maybe it's just a thunderstorm, and the wind comes up and y'all have a trampoline or your neighbor has a trampoline, what happens to that? You find it three blocks away. That tree is like a big trampoline sitting out there going, hey, wind, catch me. And yet it doesn't move. It doesn't blow away. Not saying some don't, right? But most of them stay. Most of them withstand. And it's not because of the canopy, what you see. It's because of what you don't see. I would subject to you that with our life of faith, our journey of faith, what keeps us strong and rooted in Christ is not what people see. It's not necessarily going to church. It's not necessarily how loud we sing the song, whatever the song might be. It's not necessarily all of those things. It's in that 15 minutes of Daniel's life, right? When we're praying to God, when we're reading our scripture, when we're spending time with the Father, that's the part, according to Paul, that gives us roots. It can be a tremendous thing because we can be tempted to not take that time every day, to spend time praying, to spend time reading scripture, to spend time in fellowship, to spend time listening to God after we're done talking to God. It can be tempting to move on. But what I think happens, and I found this picture. Uh, see if you like this picture. What do you think about this picture? Can you see it? I, I never know. It didn't come up. There you go. It's almost as if in our quiet time, our inner being and the inner being of the Holy Spirit of God meet together and form an arrangement that we're going to hang out and be friends, right? God strengthens us in our roots when we spend time with him. And when he does that, our roots want to go deeper and deeper, right? And so we're working together with God, spiritually speaking, to do something in harmony with him. What would be the opposite of that? I could have shown every picture in the world. I had fun looking at pictures this week trying to figure out what I would include. What happened here? This is not rooted, but what? Uprooted. uprooted. <laughs> what happens to get uprooted? Maybe that, maybe that wind was just a little too much. Maybe the roots weren't quite high enough. I know what, what happens a lot of times. You look up and you see these things and you see a puddle of water that, that messed up the ground area and made it a little sloshy. On our road, if you're leaving out, uh, headed toward, toward, toward town. On the left, we had the storm that came through a little while back, and it knocked down one tree right on the edge of the woods, right? And that tree did what? Hit another tree, and that one hit another one. The first one, the tree, I stopped, I stopped and looked, because uh, I was walking this morning, and the first one was a dead tree standing. And if you look at it, the root base wasn't much. It had all gone. If you, when it got pulled up, there was no dirt sticking to the roots. On this one, you still have the dirt. But that dead tree hit a live tree, and that tree fell and hit another one and took off a whole layer of the branches on one side. What I'm saying to you is that being in a church and being together, we have a responsibility not just to root and ground ourselves for our own sake, but what happens is if we get blown around in the wind and we're in the forest, which we are in a church, right, our rootedness affects everybody else's rootedness. And what I think happens sometimes, and this is sad and shouldn't be the case, what's interesting about this picture? The canopy of that tree is huge. How big is the root base? In relation to the rest of it. Not very big. That tree, in my mind, was a, was a top candidate to be toppled over and uprooted. Why? Not enough roots. It reminded me when I saw this of this. How in the world can this tree grow when the roots fit in a plate? 
right? And so what's going to happen here? You might have wide ones. You might be able to trim it up and keep it. It might be something that for decoration's sake is helpful. But for growing big and serving the purpose that most trees serve, right? This isn't the best example. And I wondered, I have thought about this a while back. I was reminded, of, I've been looking at uh, different things. When you go on and you look at something used on like Facebook Marketplace, I looked up a piano. All of a sudden it shows me every piano that's for sale in a 400 mile radius, right? I was uh, serving at a church one time and we had a piano. It was a beautiful baby grand piano, nice kind of a walnut uh, wood. Uh, and, and it sounded horrible. And I was talking to the lady who played it, and I said, you know, this is a beautiful piano. Why doesn't it always sound great? And she says, well, it's not the highest quality. And they told us that because of the quality of this piano, uh, we need to have it tuned every three months instead of every six months to a year. And I said, well, that's expensive on a, on a baby grand piano. And she said, yeah. But it can lose its tune in as, as little as a month. And I said, well, that's kind of odd. I said, where do we get this piano? And she said, uh, Somebody gave it to us. They had it in their home and they didn't need it anymore and so they gave it to us. I said they gave it to us because it didn't play well, right? And she, she just got smiled. <laughs> but we had this beautiful piano. And so I began to look up. It was made by a company, uh, James Madison, if I'm not mistaken, was a partial owner of this back in the day. He had sent, since sold his portion and it was based in Western North Carolina and they made pianos. And uh, they did not compete with, say, the Steinways and the Yamahas and some of the other high-end brands. They went a different direction. There's a need for pianos, or used to be, to put out as displays. How many of you have ever been to a, a mall and you see a nice piano there and it says, do not play? Why would it say, do not play, if it's a beautiful baby grand piano? Because it wasn't built to play, it was built as a decoration. And so I looked up, and some of you could see it talked about, you know, and some people argue about it or not, piano classification system. This was named a piano-shaped object. A piano-shaped object. It wasn't meant to be played as a piano. It was meant to be put in a room and look nice, and it did, but it didn't sound great. You know what we did? We sold it to somebody who wanted a piano-shaped object, and we bought ourselves a piano that sounded nice. And we, we enjoyed the music from then on. It didn't sound out of, out of tune, especially if you were to play it with other instruments. It sounded, sounded kind of bad. So we did this. So to me, this tree is like a tree-shaped object. It is a tree. You look at it, you know it's a tree, but it's not meeting its potential. I wonder how many times as Christians we could be a Christian-shaped object. I'll give you one more example. I've used this before. If you've heard it before, uh, you can just uh, chalk it up to I'm getting old and forget. Uh, how many of you have been to the garden out in the summer and you eat that first tomato of the season? You slice that thing, you put a little mayonnaise on that bread, you put a little salt and pepper, and you eat a tomato sandwich. How many of y'all been to a fast food place in February and they put a tomato-shaped object on your burger and you look at that thing and it looks like a tomato? It has all the characteristics visually of a tomato and you eat that thing and you don't think this is a tomato. Whatever it is, right, they, I think it's a tomato shaped object that they grow but doesn't have the lovely flavor of one of our homegrown tomatoes. What if, what if we as Christians, right, in order to fulfill everything that God had for us, didn't just need to look nice on the outside, we didn't just need to have that full canopy. Sometimes we as Christians, Bible talks about this a lot. We're, we're good to look at on one side, but the root's not so deep. I think the Bible refers to that as hypocrites, right? We, we live it and we look it, but always when the wind blows, we're not as strong as we need to be. And what if Paul is saying here, listen, the key to, to, to living life long, I think is to bow your knees in prayer. To realize that our power comes not from us trying harder, but from the power of God. We can be strengthened by the power of God, not our own power. We develop then faith, hope, and love. All of these are byproducts of this time that we spend in prayer. And what happens at the end of that is that we receive from the Spirit of God roots that go deep. Not because we tried hard, not because 15 minutes is a magical formula and I read my Bible today and I checked it off and I went about my way, but because we developed a relationship with the Spirit of God. We developed a relationship where we understand the love of God for us. And, and what we do is we turn that into being rooted deeply in our inner being, in our spiritual lives, right? 
so that the winds may blow and the storms may come. And you know what's true about life? The wind will blow and the storm will come. Spiritually speaking, yes. Weather speaking, also yes. We don't know when it's going to happen. But spiritually speaking, we're going to face the storms in life. We're going to face those where the opposite response of faith, hope, and love is going to be our natural response if we're not rooted. Instead of having faith, we're going to give up. Instead of having hope, we're going to look at God and say he must not answer all of his promises. Instead of being filled with love, we're going to be filled with bitterness and anger. And so what we need then is that precious time with God. And if we cultivated that precious time with God as Daniel did, it is the last thing we would let go. If threatened, if tried to be bribed, it is the last thing we'd let go of. Whatever other time during the day that we had to let go of, the one thing we wouldn't give up on, which sometimes is the first thing we give up on when we're busy, right, is our time with God. What does that look like in a Christian life? What does that look like in a spiritual life? And we want this. Right? We want that strength, but we also want what's at the bottom. So a couple of things that I've learned from Paul from his prayer. We're going to change the channel next week and go in a different direction. But I want us to take a couple of things with us. Number one, Paul prayed for groups of people an awful lot. Even more so than we have recorded necessarily of him praying for individuals. He prayed for groups. I think our, our church needs prayer to have strong roots. I'm not saying we don't have them, but I'm saying we can always grow stronger and be more deeply rooted in Christ than we are the day before, right? And then I think sometimes there are people going through difficult times and I think their roots are gonna be tested. I think roots are being tested, spiritually speaking, because of difficult times, because of what people are going through. Some of those we know, some of those we read time and time, all of our prayer requests, right? Some of those we know, some of them we don't know. How, how are people going to react? So what I'd like to do, I planned especially this Sunday to have a little bit less so that we could end a little bit early. But what I want us to do, we've got 10 minutes left. Would we take three or four minutes of that? And I want us to spend the first, let's say two minutes, can we spend two minutes this morning? You're not taking any time out of your day. You're already here, right? We got time left on the clock. I'm going to let you out early. Can we spend two minutes praying for our church to have deep roots? Paul prayed for their church. Paul prayed for the Ephesians to have deep roots. Could we pray that our church would be rooted and grounded in the love of God and faith of God and hope of God? And then I wonder, the second two, two minutes, we're just going to spend four, two, four or five minutes here, okay? The second couple of minutes, do you know somebody who's hurting? Do you know somebody who's going through a tough time? What if you prayed for them to, to grow stronger in Christ, to have that rooted relationship? And then maybe at the end, maybe you just commit yourself a little bit more to those 15 minutes, to that time with Christ so that you could be deeply rooted. I want to sit down. I just want us to spend some time as a church. Nobody's going to be talking out loud. You don't have to move around or, or go in your, in your heart, in your mind. Let's spend the next three or four minutes in prayer for our church to have strong roots as a in the community, in our church, all of that. For individuals that we know are being tested in their roots right now, that God would remind them of how much he loved them, that they would see that and then renew our own commitment to pray and to enjoy the byproducts of that rootedness ourselves.
We believe together that God honors the prayers of his people and that God honors the combined prayers of his church where two or three or more gathered we can ask in his name. I want us to end our time together today with this benediction. This is the next sentence that Paul utters after he lists us his prayer. This is how he ends his prayer for the, for the Ephesians church in, in uh, chapter 3. But this is the end of it, and we're going to do this, and this will be our benediction. We'll be, we'll be um, uh, uh, done for the day. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. Can you imagine Paul ending a prayer with that? God, we've asked you for a lot of things. You're capable of so much more. According to the power at work within us, not our power, but his power, right? To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. We're dismissed today.